Let's pray together. Father in heaven, tonight is your night. It's not my night. It's not our night. Tonight is your night. And so, Father, we ask that you'll be with us now as we open the word. We pray that you would open us. Father, you know us from the crown of our head to the sole of our foot. You know us inside and out. You know all of our weaknesses. You know our strengths. You know our foibles. You know our skeletons. You know our idiosyncrasies. And Father, as we learned last night, you not only love us, you like us. And you choose to call us your friends forever. Father, tonight as we learn how to grow in grace, may you speak to us. May this be a very practical message a message that every person can reach in and say I can use that I can use that I can use that father please condescend to be in this room in the person of your spirit condescend to be in these hearts imperfect though we be we're trusting to Jesus and it is in his name that we pray let everyone say Amen. I was baptized June 6, 1996. Could you get me a little water, Marquise? Thank you so much. I was baptized June 6, 1996, which means then that I've been a Christian now for the better part of 14 years, right? And when you become a Christian, uh, especially if you came from the background that I came from, how many of us were not raised in an Adventist context? Not raised in an Adventist context. Okay. Now, everyone has a conversion story. Can you say amen to that? Because God doesn't have grandchildren. He only has children. Right? You're not, you're not born, born again. You're, you might have been born an Adventist, but you still have to become a Christian. Can you say amen to that? But one of the things for those of us that came from sort of outside to inside is that there's this whole new language. There's this, I remember when I first began to attend a Seventh-day Adventist camp meeting, people were coming up to me and they were saying, hey, are you home church or conference church? I don't know. So I asked my friend who brought me to this camp meeting. It was an independent camp meeting. That's how I came into the church. And, and I said, are we home church or conference church? He said, we're home church. So I'd go to my friends. I'd say, I'm home church. They'd say, good on you. Good for you. And then I began to hear people talking about the spirit of prophecy. The spirit of prophecy says. The spirit of prophecy says. And people were saying, Maranatha. They were using words like propitiation and justification and sanctification. And all of this new parlance, all of this new language is a little bit difficult to navigate if you've come from the outside to the inside. Are we together, everyone? Yes, you have to sort of figure it out. You, you, you begin to recognize the language before you really know what it means. And one of the language, one of the nomenclatures that we use is this idea that, that your relationship with God, that your relationship with Jesus is analogous to a walk. Analogous to a what? So I might say something like, Mike, how's your walk with Jesus? Are we together on that? Would you understand what I was asking? Or I might say, Isaac, how's your walk with God? Would we understand that? And so this idea that, that I'm walking with God, I have never yet in some 14 years now of being in the faith ever heard anyone refer to the Christian religion and our, our experience in it as the Christian leap. Or are we together? The Christian jump. It's always the Christian what? Walk. It's always the Christian walk. Okay. So what we're going to do tonight is talk about the single secret to succeeding in the Christian what? Walk. walk. Now notice the language there and it's ambitious. The single secret to succeeding in the Christian walk. Beloved, the presentation that I'm going to share with you tonight, I wish that I had heard one year, two years, three years into my walk with Jesus. Because literally the secret to succeeding in the Christian walk is so simple. There's just one secret. Open your Bibles to the book of Luke. Gospel of Luke. And here we find Jesus, Luke chapter 5, telling a series of parables. A series of what, everyone? Parables. Now, sometimes Jesus' parables were very long. For example, in Luke chapter 15, you have the whole chapter is composed of just three parables. The lost coin, the lost sheep, and the lost son, the prodigal son. And half of that chapter is the prodigal son. So, so sometimes Jesus' parables were very long, and other times they were very short. Now, why did Jesus speak in parables? Where the, well, there were certainly a variety of reasons. And one of the reasons that Jesus would have spoken in parables is, is just imagine the difficulty of trying to communicate the glories of heaven. 
There are no agendas. There is no violence. There is no unkindness. There is no sin. There is no selfishness. And you've got to try to communicate that to people who are steeped in sin and selfishness, who have no frame of reference outside of death and disease, etc. Are we together, everyone? And so it's difficult to do. There, uh, have you ever traveled to an exotic location? Anyone here ever been overseas to someplace exotic? Okay. And, and, and when you go there, there's, there's smells. And there's, the people dress a little different. They look a little different. They, and when you come back home and you try to tell them what it's like, you say, well, it's, it can be difficult to sort of encapsulate that, that the differentness of another culture, of another place. It smells and, and everything that makes that place different. And, and when you're trying to communicate it, it, if you don't have some point of reference, it's going to be difficult to help them to understand where you've been. Are we together, everyone? And so Jesus is trying to communicate the glories of heaven. And he would come down and he would try and communicate it. But, but it's going to be hard. How do you communicate the glories of sinlessness to a people who are so steeped in sin that they can't imagine life without it? And so Jesus frequently spoke in parables to take, to take the, 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 the indescribable and almost the incommunicable and try to communicate it in very simple terms. And sometimes his, his parables were just so staggering and so uh, befuddling that the people didn't, people didn't have a clue what he was saying. He would say things like this. He would say, fellas... The kingdom of heaven is like, and here's the disciples waiting with bated breath, you know, like, yeah. You know, when you talk about a kingdom, for, for the disciples, the kingdom is Rome, right? Rome is the consummate kingdom. All roads lead to Rome. Rome wasn't built in a day. When in Rome, do as the... So when Jesus says, I mean, if the kingdom of Rome is glorious, what then is the kingdom of heaven? And so Jesus would speak and he'd say, fellas, you know, the, the kingdom of heaven, it's like, and they're waiting, you know, because they're just waiting for the moment whoosh, when you get to unsheath the swords and begin to lop the heads of the Romans off. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed. <laughs> wow. And the disciples are like, What did he say? Right? Because in their minds, a kingdom is a kingdom. A kingdom is power. A, a kingdom is strength. And a kingdom is glory. And, and so Jesus begins to say, yeah, 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 yeah. In fact, it's like a mustard seed because it, and he's off with his illustration and the disciples have totally tuned him out. <laughs> Jesus frequently spoke in parables to try and take the almost incommunicable and communicate it to people who are having difficulty understanding these radically and wonderful spiritual things. And in Luke chapter 5, we find Jesus tell three parables in rapid succession. Okay? Now, the thrust of these parables is the inappropriate mingling of the old and the new. The inappropriate mingling of the what? The old and the new. And these parables are very short, very simple, very easy to understand. We'll pick it up in verse 36. Luke chapter 5, verse 36. Then he spoke a parable to them saying, No one puts a piece from a new garment on a what? On an old one. Otherwise, the new makes a tear. And also the piece that was taken out of the new does not match the old. Okay, first parable. No one does this. It's an analogy. Verse 37, and no one puts what kind of wine? New wine into what kind of wineskins? Old wineskins or else the new wine will burst the wineskins and be spilled and the wineskins will be ruined. But new wine must be put into what? New wineskins and both are preserved. Jesus here is making a very simple illustration. Two parables. We'll come to the third in just a moment. Where he's trying to say, be careful how you mingle the old with the... New. Now, now there are, you can look up the commentaries, you can see what the scholars have to say, and most will tell you that there are two primary applications of Jesus, new and old here, okay? And the first is that there is going to be a radical transition in the Judaic economy that goes something like this. Jesus has presented himself as the Messiah. We've already talked about that in our opening presentation. Jesus has presented himself as the Messiah, but if Jesus is the Messiah, what were the words of Ellen White? This would involve the overthrow of the whole structure which for generations the rabbis had been rearing. And so he's basically saying, if you're going to accept me as the Messiah, I'm not going to fit nicely and neatly into your Jewishness, into your post-exilic Jewishness. If you accept me as the Messiah, we're going to have to start from scratch. Are we together, everyone? In other words, you're not going to say, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Jesus as the Messiah, we'll incorporate that. In. No, 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 no. Jesus as the Messiah was totally new, totally radical, totally revelatory. Remember what he said in the Sermon on the Mount? You have heard that it was said, what? 
but I say unto you. And so basically he's saying, if you're going to accept me as the Messiah, you can't take a little bit of me, the new wine, and put me into those old wineskins. Something's going to give. You can't take me as the Messiah and my, my Messianic identity and put me on an old patch because there's going to be a tear. Basically what he's arguing for here is that radical transition from a pre-Messianic economy to a post-Messianic Jew Jewish economy. And he's basically saying if you try to intermingle these inappropriately, the whole thing is going to go south. Are we together? Yes, there's a second application. Not only is it the transition from pre-Messianic to post-Messianic Judaic economy, it's also the personal transition prior to being a believer in the Messiah to being a believer in the Messiah. And if you try to take the old and mingle it with the new, there can be tension, there can be difficulty, there can be strife, there can be tearing. Are we together, everyone? So he says, be careful. In ancient Palestine, for example, if you wanted to, to, where's that bottle that you got me, Marquise? You see, they didn't have these things. Plastic is a modern invention. We'll talk about plastic on Sabbath, incidentally. Plastic is a modern invention. You can take grape juice, you can put it in plastic, you can seal it, vacuum sealing it, and it'll be fine. In Jesus' day, if you wanted to keep grape juice, what you normally did was you took the stomach of a lamb or of a cow or of a sheep or of a goat, you, you tanned it, you usually turned it inside out, you stitched it, it was called a wine skin. A wine, what everyone? Skin. But, but do your very best. It was very difficult to make it perfectly sanitary. And so when you took grape juice, right, and you put grape juice in that wine skin with all of its sugars and all of its acidity and you begin to bounce it around in the hot Palestinian sun. Have you ever left, ju have you ever left juice out overnight? Yeah, what happens in the morning? When you open the lid, what does it say? Right? What's happened? The fermentation process has happened, right? And if you get a little bit of fermentation in a plastic bottle, imagine that sloshing around in the inside of a stomach of an animal in the hot Palestinian sun. Boom! <laughs> Are we together? So he says you have to be careful. You have to be careful how you mingle the old with the new. You cannot just randomly, uh, uh, undiscerned, r mingle the old with the new. And then he tells a third parable. Turn your attention to the third parable here because we're going to spend most of our time here. Verse 39. He says, and no one. What's the phrase, everyone? Notice that he has begun all three parables the very same way. Did you notice that, Bible students? Look there in verse 36. No one puts a piece. Verse 37. No one puts new wine. Jesus is appealing to your common sense. He's basically saying, no one does this. He is appealing to your common sense. No one does this. No one does this. And now verse 39. And no one, having drunk old wine immediately desires the new for he says the old is better now no one having drunk what kind of wine old wine immediately desires the new why because he is still persuaded that the old is better now old wine is just exactly what it sounds like it's old wine right and today we have uh, refrigerators we have vacuum sealing we have plastic and so there is a very clear demarcation between the unfermented juice of the grape and the fermented juice of the wine in other words they're in totally different places in the grocery store isn't that right over here you get the welches and over here you get the chardonnay right and so because of the because of modern technology there's a very clear demarcation between unfermented and fermented but in the times of Jesus this clear nice neat distinction would not have existed the moment that you begin to reconstitute grape juice or you harvest it fresh and you try to store it you have the fermentation process that's beginning because the refrigerators that we have today slow that process are we together everyone this is incidentally why Paul said to Timothy do not be given to much wine or take a little wine for your stomach and speaking of the elders he said do not be given to much wine because even the unfermented juice of the grape in those days would already have the fermentation process beginning are we together everyone and so Jesus says a man who is accustomed to drinking the old wine the rotten wine the fermented wine the alcoholic wine he does not immediately desire the new because he still thinks the old is what better now there is a key word there in verse 39 there is a key word, and, and it is the word upon which the whole passage is. In fact, if you lift this one word from the passage, you actually have Jesus saying the very opposite of what he's saying. What do you think the key word is there in verse 39? Take a look at it. No man having drunk the old wine immediately desireth the new, for he is persuaded the old is better. What's the key word there? It's the word immediately. In fact, if you lift that word out of there, just listen to how it reads without that word. And no one having drunk old wine desires the new, for he says the old is better. If you lift the word immediately, you have Jesus saying, this doesn't happen. A man who's accustomed to the old 
never likes the new because he thinks the old is better. But the insertion of the word immediately, it is the pivotal word, it is the hinge word upon which the whole passage moves. Jesus says, no man having grown accustomed to the old wine, and then he inserts the word, what's the word? Immediately desires the new because he is persuaded what? The old is better. So a question. Can this man come to appreciate the new wine, the fresh wine, the unfermented, non-alcoholic juice of the grape? Can he come to appreciate it? Yes or no? But it doesn't happen immediately, which means it takes time. Are we together? So, can this man come to appreciate... In other words, just think of this. We could go to any urban area here in the United States. We could go to Huntsville. We could go to uh, Los Angeles. We could go to Chicago. We could go all over the world. And, and we could find an inebriated man or a woman on the street, right? We could find them there, passed out, and we could, we could sort of waken them from their stupor. And we say, hey, hey, sit up, friend, sit up. Oh, hey, hey, thanks, man. Thanks. Hey, hey, we brought you something. Hey, we brought you, we brought you some, some good stuff. We brought you the good stuff, and behind our backs, we have a fresh, cool bottle of Welch's. We say, hey, man, you've been drinking the rotten stuff. Oh, hey, man, thank you so much. You've been drinking, we got the good stuff, right? And so we can hand him that nice, fresh, oh, thank you so much. And he's going to take that, and he's going to drink it. Boom. What's going to be his response? Is it going to be this? Is it going to be, whoa. Where do you keep this? Mercy. Ah, this tastes so fresh and refreshing and, and so, what, is that going to be his response? He's like, oh, oh, what, what? Now, could that man come to like the Welch's? Could that man come to like the fresh juice of the grape? Yes or no? But it's going to take time. It doesn't happen immediately, which means it involves a process. And that's Jesus' point. See, Jesus here is discussing the mingling of the old and the new, the transition from the old to the new in two senses, the scholars tell us. Number one, from pre-Messianic economy to post-Messianic economy. I'm the Messiah. If you accept me, we're going to have to overthrow the whole tradition, as she says, that the rabbis for generations had been rearing. But not just in the, the economic sense, the Jew Jewish econom economy, but also in your personal sense. When you begin to accept the new wine of the gospel and the new wine of the Messianic identity of Jesus and the new wine of the Lord, Lordship of Jesus, then, then there's going to be a transition. And that transition does not happen immediately. It involves a process, which means it takes time. Let's do that again. That transition does not happen immediately. It involves a process, which means it takes time. Can the man come to appreciate? Can the man come to appreciate the pure juice of the grape? Can he come to appreciate the new wine? But it's going to happen over time. Are we together, everyone? Now, with this in mind, with this sort of background information in mind, I want to just give you a quick tour like this. One, two, three. Just a very quick tour of three Pauline passages. Three passages from the writing of Paul. These are not going to be obscure passages. We're not even going to be in Thessalonians. We're not going to be in Titus. We're not going to be in Philemon. We're going to look at three exceptionally well-known passages. And in each of those three passages, we're going to notice a phrase. A what, everyone? A phrase. And we're going to ask ourselves a very simple question. What is the purpose of this phrase? Okay? And all of you theologians will be able to get it just like that. Go with me to the book of Romans. We'll come back to Luke. Go with me to the book of Romans. What book are we going to, everyone? Romans chapter 1. In Romans chapter 1, in fact, in Romans on the whole, scholars will tell you, and they are right, um, that basically what you have in Romans is Paul's most thorough treatment of the gospel, his most systematically thorough treatment of the gospel. And uh, incidentally, Bible students, Paul is going to Rome... We'll see who can get this. For what purpose? He tells us right in the book. He's going to Rome for what purpose? Who can get it? Trial. To preach. That's in a, Yeah, he is going to preach while he's there. But he's going for a specific purpose. Does anyone know it? To, you, that's, you said it. For financial support. That's exactly right. Paul is going to Rome for financial support. Do, do you know why? Because he's headed somewhere. Does anyone know where he's going? He's going to Spain. Paul is on his way to Spain. You can read it, Romans chapter 15. In fact, he says, hey, listen, I'm happy to come to Rome and I'm happy to preach among the Romans there. He says, but, but when I preach Christ, I want to preach on a foundation that no man has laid before. I want to go where the name of Christ has not been named and so I'm happy to make a stop in Rome, but I'm primarily interested in generating funds because I'm on my way to Spain. He never made it. Nero had something to say. 
He never made it to Rome. He never made it to Spain, rather. And so he's on his way to Rome, and as he's writing out his gospel to the Romans, he sets forth his, his clearest and most systematic exposition of the gospel. I mean, Paul is a tactician here. He is a surgeon here. He moves from one, the depravity of the world, two, the depravity of the Gentiles, three, the depravity of the whole world, four, the righteousness of Abraham. Five, he's just... Tsh, tsh, tsh. He's, just he's a surgeon. And in Romans chapter 1, especially up through ver, uh, cha uh, Romans chapter 1 up through uh, chapter 8, you just have Paul's exposition and explication of the gospel in a way that you don't find anywhere else in the New Testament. Are we together, everyone? Now, most scholars believe that in Romans chapter 1, as Paul is introducing what's to come, he gives you a synopsis of the gospel. Okay? He gives you a synopsis of the what, everyone? of the gospel and we find it in two familiar verses verses 16 and 17 Romans 1 16 and 17 and this is really Paul's distillation of the gospel okay and so you'll be familiar with it you'll probably know it know it many of you by heart he says for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes for the Jew first and also for the Greek, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Amazing. This is the gospel, friends. This is Paul's distillation of the gospel, that, that the righteousness of God is revealed in the gospel, and that God is communicating that gospel, and He is lavishing the benefits of that gospel upon those who believe. Upon those who what? Believe. That's, that's, that's verse 16 there, right? And so we derive, incidentally, the whole Protestant Reformation is founded in no small degree on those words. The just shall live by faith. Many historical theologians have made a case that these are the single most important words in the entire New Testament. These are the words that Martin Luther read. The just shall live by faith. And ting, 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 you have 95 theses on the door of Wittenberg. The just shall live by faith. But there's something very interesting there. It says the just shall live by faith, but that the gospel is communicated. Look at it right there in verse 17. Verse 17, how does it begin? For, for therein the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. Look at that phrase. The gospel is by faith alone, through grace alone, to the glory of God alone. He says, but the gospel is revealed, what's our phrase? From faith to what? To faith. Now what, pray tell, does this mean? From faith to faith? What it means is that the gospel is always by faith. Can you say amen? You receive the great truths of the gospel by faith. You can't earn it. You can't buy it. You can't purchase it. It cannot be owed you. It is always by faith, but it's from one level of faith to the next level of faith. And, and implied in the passage, to the next level of faith, to the next level of faith, to the next level of faith. In other words, what Paul is saying right here in, in, in the classic benchmark archetypal passage of the gospel, he is saying the gospel involves a process. Amen. The gospel involves a what, everyone? Process. A process. And what's our phrase? Faith to faith. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. Another Pauline phrase here, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. We'll stay right in the New Testament. Our second of three Pauline passages, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. Here's another passage very well known in the writings of Paul, beginning in verse 18. But we all with what kind of face? Unveiled face. He's contrasting the experience of Moses with the experience of Christ. Moses veiled his face. He says, but we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being, what does your Bible say? transformed into the same image, and then there's a phrase, from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. What's Paul saying? Paul is saying that we are being changed into the very character likeness of Christ. That was the sequence we went through there on the opening night. We talked about blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are they that mourn, blessed are the meek, blessed are they that hunger and thirst for righteousness, blessed are the merciful, blessed are the pure in heart, blessed are the peacemakers, blessed are those that are persecuted. Are we together, everyone? In other words, there's a transition here, there's a sequence here, and the Apostle Paul says we can be transformed from glory to glory to glory. In other words, from one level of Christian character development to the next level of Christian character development to the next level of Christian character development so that at any point in our Christian experience we can look and see that we still have a vast, vast, vast distance to go to, to Christ's likeness, but hallelujah, we can also look back and say, I have come a ways. 
right? I've got a long ways to go, but I have come a ways. Are we together, everyone? And so he says this transition takes place, and what's his phrase? From glory to glory. From one level of Christian character development to, to the next level, to the next level, to the next level. What's he saying? He is saying that it involves a process, which means it takes time. Stay in 2 Corinthians, look at chapter 4. Stay right there, 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 16. Paul says, therefore, we do not lose heart. We don't give up. We don't faint. Therefore, we do not lose heart, even though our outward man is perishing. What does he mean by outward man? The flesh, the physical body, the outward man is perishing. You've read the New Testament. You've read the book of Acts. Paul would go into a city. He would be stoned. He was shipwrecked. He would be rejected. So he says the outward man is perishing. The outward man is living a very difficult life. In fact, on one occasion he said, my life is so difficult that there's a desire in me just to be dead so that the next moment I could be with Christ. Right? So that I, the next conscious thought that I would have would, was to be with Christ. I mean, that's what he's saying. So he says the outward man is what? Perishing. But the inward man is what? Being, what does your Bible say? Renewed. Now you tell me, what's the root word of renewed? New. Hey, that's what we're talking about. New versus the old. He says the outward man is perishing, but the, the inward man is being made new. But then he gives us a phrase, and what's the phrase? Day by day. How is the inward man made new, everyone? Day, what? By day, by day. Now look, listen to these three phrases. These are not obscure Pauline passages. The, the, these are the heart and soul of Paul's understanding of the, of the gospel. Romans chapter 1, 2 Corinthians 3, 2 Corinthians chapter 4. What are our four phrases? From faith to faith, from glory to glory, and what? Day by... What's he saying? What's he saying? He's saying that this gospel transformation does not happen immediately, which means it takes time, which means it involves a process. Hey, that's what Jesus said. Jesus said, no man having drunk the old wine, what was that word? What was that pivotal word? What was that hinge word? Immediately desires the new because he is persuaded the old is. Can that man come to like the new? Yes or no? But it doesn't happen immediately, which means it takes time because it involves a process. Now there's this woman. You might have heard of her. Her name is Ellen White. You ever heard that name before? Yeah. I hope when I say the name Ellen White that your word association is positive. It should be positive. And let me apologize to you right now on behalf of anyone who has ever misused Ellen White in your Christian experience. Yeah. Let me tell you something. I have a great burden for this because I was a purple-haired, tattooed, radical punk rocker who had no interest in God or the things of God and least of all Christianity and I was going into a vegetarian vegan restaurant because I was a vegan vegetarian, right? I was a purple-haired punk rocker, socially motivated, politically motivated. I mean, my whole life was agnostic, probably leaning toward atheistic, but these people were friendly, these people were kind, these people were gracious. I thought they were the weirdest people in the world. <laughs> now you need to understand, I'm the one with the, with the baggy pants dressing like a girl. I'm the one with the tattoos, with the rings. I'm the one with the dreadlocked hair the no hair, the purple hair, the yellow hair, the shaved hair. I'm that person, and I think these people are weird. <laughs> and I would go into their restaurant, and uh, after I, I began to, to, to be in there uh, frequently, because I was living in, you know, the heart, the, the heart of the United States. I was living in the, in the beef belt, and here's a vegetarian restaurant in my beef belt town, and they came to know me and, the, and my friends, my other punk rock friends, and they began to say, Oh, look, it's Brother David. <laughs> Hey, Brother David, would you like some mashed potatoes? <laughs> yeah. Would you like some shepherd's pie? It's vegan. Wow. Yeah, all right. Great to see you, Brother David. Praise the Lord. Here's a 20% discount and a free juice. I was like, oh, these people are creepy, but the food is good. Are you with me? That whole Brother David thing, that whole... And then my other friends began to come in. My other friends began to come in. And, and, and though I thought they were the weirdest, strangest, oddest people in the world, listen very carefully here. These people loved me. These people didn't treat me like I was a purple-haired punk rocker with tattoos all over me. They treated me like I was Beaver Cleaver. Oh, look, it's Brother David. 
I'd come in and they'd say, oh, look, Brother David with his, with his crew, his band. Come on in. And over time, I began to develop a relationship with them and I began to ask them questions. And, and after about a year and a half of, of, of patronizing their restaurant, it came time for me to go away to school and I was going to the University of Wyoming there and I was studying medicine. And just as I left, they said, um, you know, we've got this book and, and um, you know, it's been a blessing to us and we give away a lot of them and, and uh, we, we thought you might like to read it. I said, sure, sure. So they took the time to write on the inside cover, Brother David. This book has been such a blessing to us. We think it'll be a blessing to you. We hope you have time to read it while you're busy at school. God bless the veggies crew. <laughs> and they put the great controversy in my hand. Well, I took that book. I took that book. Listen, listen to me very carefully. No intentions of reading it. Okay, in my culture, in my punk rock culture, you could be anything. You could be a transvestite. You could be a homosexual. You could be a Buddhist. You could be a Hare Krishna. You could be anything and you were fine. But the moment you became a Christian, it was the highest form of treason. Okay, for, for me, my association with Christian was naive, simpleton, unsophisticated, uneducated, controlling, religious right, everything I abhorred and opposed and loathed. And so they put that book in my hand. I had no intentions of reading it, but I put it under my arm. Thank you so much. That book would have landed in file 13 so many times, but for the fact that they took the time to write something on the inside. And I felt like, you know what, to throw this book away would be a dishonor to the people that gave it to me. And so it stayed on my shelf. It stayed there for a year. Year. And God in his inimitable and wonderful ways brought circumstances into my life. And one day, hallelujah, that book came off of the shelf. Can you say amen? In the first reading of that book, I remember reading the better part of 200 pages in two weeks. In two weeks, I'm preparing for baptism. I mean, come on now. Come on, how do you go from being a purple-haired punk rocker with tattoos all over you with a total ambivalence and in, in some situations an outright hostility toward Christianity and you open up that book amen. and your whole worldview changes in less than two weeks, beloved? Are you, can, you, can you say amen? So let me apologize. Let me apologize to you on behalf of anyone who has wronged you with the ministry of Ellen White. Let me tell you, this woman was a spirit-filled, gospel-preaching, balanced woman of faith. And I know, don't get me wrong, I know that people will go in and they'll dig out the strongest statements and the most radical statements and they'll, they'll string them all together and they'll make her look terrible and they'll make her look horrid. Let me, you can do the same thing with Scripture. You can do it. So listen, listen, listen. I think it was, uh, I'm going to be careful here. I think it was Socrates who said, no belief system should be judged by its abuse. So if Ellen White has been misused, do not discount what is good and true on the basis of the misuse. Water can be used. Water can be used to quench the throat. Mm. Man, that tastes good. It can also be used for drowning people. But don't stop drinking water because some people use water to drown people. Are we together, everyone? Are we together? So here we go. Let me just read you three quick statements. Three. How many? Quick. 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 Some are saying, is he going to quote Ellen White? Yes, he's going to do it. He's going to do it. Here we go. Here we go. Listen very carefully. Tell me how this sounds. There is no such thing as instantaneous sanctification. Okay, okay. Have you ever heard of instant lemonade? Okay, so there's instant lemonade. Have you ever heard of instant coffee? No, you haven't. You're like, no. Instant, what did he say? We don't even know. We don't even know what he's talking about. Coffee? I never heard that word before. Okay, have you ever heard of instant tea? Okay, so there's instant lemonade, and there's instant coffee, and there's instant tea, but she says there is no such thing as instantaneous what? Sanctification. Now you say sanctification. There you go with those big words. Simple. Sanctify, make holy. Wow. Right? There is no such thing as instantaneous you being holy. Amen. Right? Sanctification. Now you can be declared holy, and that happens instantly. Yeah. I wish we had time to develop that. She says, there is no such thing as instantaneous sanctification. Listen carefully now. True sanctification is a daily work. Amen. What kind of a work? Daily. A daily work continuing as long as life shall last. Faith I live by 116. Second statement. You do not at one bound.
bound reach perfection? Now, bound. What would be a synonym there? Ha ha! You do not in one leap reach perfection. Sanctification is the work of a lifetime. That's right. Amen. Are we together, everyone? And the final one here, that's 2SM. That's uh, uh, 3SM 193, the final one. Sanctification is the progressive work of a lifetime. So sanctification is the progressive work of a what? Of a lifetime. And there is no such thing as what? Instantaneous sanctification. And you do not in one leap or bound reach perfection. I want you to listen to what Jesus is saying. I want you to listen to what Paul is saying. And I want you to listen to what Ellen White is saying. Listen very carefully. Jesus says, no man having drunk the old wine. What was that word? What was that word? What was that word? Immediately desires the new. Because he is still persuaded what? The old is better. Can this man come to appreciate the new? But it doesn't happen immediately, which means it takes time because it involves a process. That's Jesus. Paul says that we receive the gospel by faith, but it is from faith to faith. He says we are being transformed from glory to glory, and we're not fainting, even though the outward man is dying, the inward man is being renewed day by day, day by day. Faith to faith, glory to glory, day by day. Ellen White says, no such thing as instantaneous sanctification. It's the work of a lifetime, and you do not in one bound arrive at perfection. I guess what these people are trying to say is, it involves a process. Are we together, everyone, on that? It's a process. Now, I'm going to just open my heart here a little bit. And you tell me if you can relate to this. Okay, I'm not going to pull a, a preacher manipulation thing on you. I'm just going to ask you a question as a person to a person. This is how it's worked in my life. When I was a purple-haired punk rocker, I had many, 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 many issues in my life. Many things. And one of the chiefest things that I think God found most offensive was that I swore something fierce. I just had a terrible potty mouth. Terrible. Just beep, beep, beep. He thought I was a rapper. Beep, 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 beep. I just, I just swore terrible. My swearing was so bad that even among my friends who swore continually, my swearing was proverbially bad. Now, here's the interesting thing. I wanted to stop swearing because I thought it sounded adolescent. I thought it sounded unintelligent. Here I was studying medicine, 4.0 student at the University of Wyoming, and I just can't beep, 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 beep. I, sound, I mean, I sound like a, a record of some kind. And so I wanted to stop swearing, and I tried. And it would last anywhere between one minute and one day. It was just like part of who I was. It, was just, it would just come out. Okay? But on June 6, 1996, I went into the baptism. Now listen to me very carefully. I went into the baptistry. I wasn't thinking about swearing. That wasn't even in my mind. I wasn't thinking, oh, here we go. I'm going to be a non-swearer when I come up out of these waters. <laughs> No, 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 no. I went in and I was one thing on my mind. Jesus. Amen. Wow. I'm a sinner. He's a savior. What are we saying in baptism? The death that Jesus died? <gasps> you hold your breath. <gasps> right? Adam breathed. Adam had the, God breathe into his nostrils the breath of life. All throughout scripture, breathing. <sighs> symbol of life. And so in baptism, when you... <gasps> Hold your breath, it's a symbol of death. You know what you're saying when you hold your breath? The death that Jesus died was the death that I deserved. And then you're put under the water. You know what you're saying? The burial that he received was the burial that I deserved. Now, you don't stay there. That's the good news. Amen? Then the pastor brings you up out of the water. Do you know what you're saying? His resurrection is my only hope of a future resurrection. That's baptism. That's baptism. The death that he desired was, died was the death that I deserved. The life, uh, the burial that he received is the burial that I deserved. And his resurrection is my only hope of a future resurrection. Can you say amen? So I didn't go down thinking, I'm not going to swear anymore. I'm not going to, I'm going to be a non-swearer when I come out of these waters. Because swearing was about that big and I got a whole lot of things. But let me tell you something. When I went down and I came back up from that time to the present. What is it today? April, oh, tax day. Woo! Do you remember that? Some of you are thinking, oh, mercy. <laughs> I thought it was the 14th. You're going to go running out of here. No. April 15th. You still got till midnight to get that thing stamped. April 14th. I can tell you as God in heaven is witness from June 16th, 1996 to April 14th, 2010, I have sworn one time. And I can tell you where I was. 
I was hanging from the side of a rock. Because I'm a rock climber. And I was out with my friend Greg Parker, who's not a believer, and we were doing what's called bouldering. Now, bouldering is where you're climbing lower rocks, sort of, you know, sort of 15 to 20 feet, and you have little pads below you. And I was just warming up, just warming up, getting ready for a good day of climbing. And I reached up and I grabbed this little pebble, and when I grabbed that little pebble, I, I began to weight it, began to pull on it, and it came off, and it was in my hand. And suddenly I was in the air. And I was in the air long enough to say, Oh, bee! <laughs> now, I'd been a believer for a year and a half. I'd been a believer for a year and a half, and I was in the air long enough to think. I was only about 20 feet up, so sort of like this balcony. I was in the air long enough to think, I ho I'm holding the little hold in my hand. I hope I don't die, because I wouldn't want that to be the last thing I ever said. Right? <laughs> Can you imagine? His last words were, no, can't have that. So, with my ninja-like, cat-like reflexes, no, I think it was the angels. Whoa, whoa. <laughs> and I landed and I... All right, I was okay. My first instinct was Greg Parker was on the other side of the rock. I ran around the side of the rock. I said, Greg, Greg, I'm sorry. I did not mean to say that. I just fell and, and he's not converted. He's not a believer. He looks at me like I have lost my mind. <laughs> Beloved, I've been in this thing for 14 years and that word has come out of my mouth once. Now listen, I think God just reached in and he said, you know, I don't like that. I don't, that mouth, I don't like that. And I think he just reached in and he said, uh, I'll take that one. Are we together? Now, beloved, I wish I could report to you today that every sin in my life has been just like that. Are you with me? I wish I could report to you today that every sin in my life has been just like that. Gone. Because some of them God just sort of takes away. And they're gone. You think, man, I used to love that thing and it's gone now. But then others, have you ever seen these little things called chihuahuas? You ever seen one? When I was growing up, we had a chihuahua. Its name was Yippee. You will notice I have not yet dignified it with the name dog. Okay? Because my friend says if you can flush it down the toilet, it's not a dog. Mercy. I agree. So this little rodent, yes. he didn't like me, and I don't like him or any of his relatives. He, he would always be just trying to nip at my, and I hated that dog when my mom wasn't around. <clears throat> right? Now the point is this. Some sins, God just says, you know what, my sister, we'll take that one. But then other sins are like those little chihuahuas, they won't leave you alone. That's right. Can you relate? You got some things you think, man, I thought this was behind me. Where did this come from? Yeah. Where, did, where did this come from? How, where, did this, uh, this, where did this, how did this happen? Are we together, everyone? Now listen to me again. No man having drunk old wine, what's the word? Immediately desires the new because he is persuaded the old is better. Paul says faith by faith. He says, from glory to glory. He says, day by day. And she says, there is no such thing as instantaneous sanctification. You do not in one leap or one bound reach perfection. It is the work of a lifetime. It doesn't happen immediately, which means it takes time. It involves a process. Beloved, how many of you can relate to this? That there were certain things that God just took from you and other things you think, why doesn't He take that one? Are we together, everyone? Have you ever been canoeing? You're like, canoeing? Do we know what a canoe is? Okay. We're going canoeing. Right now, in your mind and in mine. We're going canoeing. What are we doing? So you imagine, you're with me and, and I'm with you and we're together and we're in a canoe. And we are in the north of Minnesota. That's beautiful canoeing up there. A place called the Boundary Waters. Come on now. And so we're in the north of Minnesota, and we're canoeing. What are we doing? Canoeing. We're canoeing. And as we're canoeing, the sun is setting. It's beautiful. And the sun is just gleaming on the trees. And we're in Minnesota, so there's a moose. There's a beaver. 
Oh, there's a black bear. And the bird, can, do you see it? Are we canoeing? And the lake is perfectly calm. And you're in the canoe and I'm in the canoe and we're, we're having a good time. Now listen to me. Now listen very carefully here. Don't miss this illustration. While we're canoeing, we can see one of two things. Okay? I'm going to give you option A, then I'm going to give you option B, then we're going to take a vote. Are we ready? Option A, we're canoeing. What are we doing, everyone? We're canoeing, but then we look out. And on our beautiful, halcyonic, idyllic, calm day, we see something near the horizon that looks like this. Okay, I'm not a thespian, but this is drowning. You're thinking, oh, he's Pentecostal, he's speaking in tongues. No, 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 it's not that. It's drowning. It's drowning, right? You see somebody drowning. What are they doing? They're drowning. Okay, so that's option A. That's option what, everyone? A. A. Okay, so now same situation. We're canoeing. There's the moose. There's the beaver. There's the bear. There's the birds. And all of a sudden we hear, we think, what was that? And we look, and something has abutted itself against our canoe. We hadn't noticed it because we were so busy looking at the moose and the bear and the, and the, it's a body, just like this. And it comes right up against our canoe like this. Now, that's option B. Question. What do you want to see? Do you want to see option A? Or do you want to see option B? How many want to see option A? Who wants to see B? No, 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 no. Don't raise your hands. There's like somebody in here who wants to be a coroner. They're like... I wonder how he died. Let's cut him open. No. We're not even going to give you sickos a chance to raise your hand, okay? What do we want to see? We want to see option... But wait a minute. I'm going to ask you a simple question and you know the answer. Why do we want to see A? Because there's hope. We want to see A because there's still a chance. Beloved, listen to me. Listen to me. Listen to me. Listen. The struggle itself is a sign of life. How come no one told us this? How come no one told us that the struggle itself was a sign of life? Let me tell you, the first 23 years of my life, I never wrestled with my sin. I never struggled against my sin before I was converted. The the struggle in my life with sin before I was converted is how can I do more of it? The struggle was that the day was too short and sleep kept pulling me and I wanted to, to do it more. You know when my struggle with sin began? At conversion. Because now there was something in me warring against what my flesh wanted to do. Are you with me? Yes or no? So now listen to this. I've got a good friend. I wish I could tell you his name. I used to say his name, but I can't say it anymore. And I used to see him and I'd see him over and over and over again. And he's a good man. He's a godly man. He's a spiritual man. He's a somber man. And every time I would see this brother, I'd say, hey, brother, we'll call him brother Mark. I'd say, hey, brother Mark, how are you doing? And invariably, without exception, he would always say, I'm struggling. And it was always real heavy, like somber. I'm struggling. And I'd be like, all right. (laughs) Take care of yourself, you know. (laughs) Right? And I wouldn't see him for a couple months. And then I'd see him at another time, and I'd see him at a church, and I'd say, hey, Brother Mark, how are things? I'm struggling, David. All right. (laughs) You, You just... You keep on keeping on, buddy. Every time. Every time I would see him. Every time. Now listen, I'm going to tell you something right now. Listen to me very carefully. There was no problem with Mark struggling. The problem was, is he thought it was bad news. Come on. Come on. Ah. See, he thought his struggle was bad news. Uh Are you struggling? Come on. Listen to me. Are you struggling? 
I have, some I have some revelatory news for you today. And I apologize if you haven't heard this put quite this way before. I apologize on behalf of anyone who's ever talked to you about this before. If there's a struggle in your life, you should praise God that there's a struggle in your life. Because unconverted people don't struggle with their sin. The only people that struggle against sin are those who are trying to do what's right. If there's no struggle in your experience, that's not good news. That's bad news. You never get to the place where the struggle ends. The struggle itself is a sign of life. Beloved, what you want to see is, are you drowning? Praise God that you're still fighting to keep your head up. If you're trying to keep your head up, it means there's something in you that wants to live. That wants to do what's right. The unconverted man doesn't struggle with his sin. The unconverted woman doesn't struggle with her sin. They want to do it more. But the moment that you feel that struggle and you think, I don't want to live this way. I don't want to act this way. I don't want to look at this. I don't want to do this. I don't want to say that. I don't want to be this person anymore. You may feel as far from God as can be, but I want to tell you that struggle in itself is proof that God is living in you. Yes! Hallelujah! Oh! Ah, ah, ah. Come on. What did Jesus say? What did He say? He said, no man having drunk the old wine immediately desires the new. Can you come to like the new? But it doesn't happen immediately, which means it takes time because it involves a process. How did Paul say it? Faith to faith. Glory to day by. There is no such thing as instantaneous. You do not in one leap. Sanctification is the work of a lifetime. Open your Bibles to the book of Proverbs as we prepare to close. The book of Proverbs. Hallelujah. So there's this man, his name is Solomon, and he knew something about falling. Let me tell you that. Hey. This man knew something about sin. He had 700 wives and then some. <laughs> Figure that one out. <laughs> Proverbs chapter 24. Open your Bibles with me to Proverbs chapter 24, and we're going to read verse 16. Proverbs chapter... Everybody needs to be in this verse. Now, there are some people that probably wish this verse wasn't in the Bible, but it's still there. There are some people that get very uncomfortable with this verse, but we're going to read this verse and we're going to understand this verse and we're going to believe this verse. Proverbs chapter 24 and verse 16. It says, For a righteous man. Wow. What kind of a man? A righteous man, what does he do? Falls how many times? Seven times and what? Rises again, but the wicked shall what? Fall by calamity or some translations into destruction. Now, here we have two men, and you will notice with me that the difference between the righteous and the wicked is not that one falls and the other doesn't. Come on, come on. Does the righteous man fall? Yes. Does the wicked man fall? Yes. Here's the second question. Uh -huh. Who falls more? The righteous. Oh. I said, who falls more? The righteous. How many times does he fall? Seven. The wicked falls once. He says he falls into destruction. Now I'm going to teach you something very simple here, something very simple, very mathematical. Teach. You cannot fall if you weren't standing up. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> How are you going to fall from this position? If, if you're down, fall if you're down. The only man that can fall is the man that what? Gets up. So the Bible says a just man falls how many times? Why does he keep falling? Come on. Hey. Because he keeps getting up. Now, listen. Amen. Amen. The single secret to succeeding in the Christian walk, keep getting up. You may fall. Now you got a choice. When you have fallen, you got a choice. You can stay down, in which case you'll never fall again. Mercy. You stay down here, you'll never fall again. Wow. Uh -huh. But if you choose, if you make the risky choice, but the grace-filled choice to get back up, uh -huh. the moment you're back up, guess what is suddenly an option again? Oh. Falling. And that's what Solomon says. He says, a just man falls seven times, but that brother keeps getting back up. 
He keeps getting back up. He keeps getting... Beloved, let me tell you something. You committed that sin and you hated it. You hated it, you hated it, and you wish you hadn't done it. And you said, Jesus, I'm not going to do that again, and then you fell. But you see, something happens. Every time you fall into that sin and you get back up and you look to Jesus, something's going to happen every time. You've got to go to the cross. And you look at that cross and you think, I wish I hadn't done this. Because that's my Savior. And I know this hurts Him. And I know He made me for better than this. So Father, by Your grace, and Jesus, by Your grace, I'm going to get up. So you get up and you walk. And maybe now you make it three steps. And then you fall again. And you think, oh no, I fell again. But here's the thing. If you decide to get back up, you know where you got to go? You go to the cross. And when you go to that cross, and you see Jesus, and you think, this hurt, this hurt Him. And this hurts me, and I don't like this. And you say, Father, by Your grace, I'm going to get back up. Okay? And you walk. And now you might take three or four steps. Beloved, let me tell you something. It's all about the distances. Right? It used to be wah, 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 and one of these times, one of these times, you're going to get up from that sin. Listen to me. Wow. One of these times, you're going to get up from that sin, and you're going to walk away from it. It's gone. That was gone. That was gone. Now, you have other battles to fight. Keep getting up. Hallelujah. So there's this woman. Her name is Ellen White. She wrote a book. Oh. Listen to the title of the book. The book is called Steps. What is it? It's Steps to Christ. It's not the jump to Christ. What is it? What is it? Steps to Christ. So she's writing this book, Steps to Christ. And she says, listen very carefully. Here we go. This is the last thing. Do this. Raise your hand if this, if this applies. There are those who have known the pardoning love of Christ. Come on now. Have you known the pardoning love of Christ? Raise your hand. Come on now. There are those who have known the pardoning love of Christ and who really desire to be children of God. Does that apply to you? Just if it, if it applies, raise your hand. There are those that have known the pardoning love of Christ and really desire to be children of God, yet they realize their character is imperfect. Yes. Wow. Amen? Their life is faulty. Right. Okay? Now you tell me if the devil ever tries this one on you. And they are ready to doubt whether their hearts have ever been renewed by the Holy Spirit. Come on. Has the devil ever tried that one on you? By the way, by the way, by the way, if he does, you're in good company. Because there was a man named Jesus. And Jesus was baptized. And he heard this voice from heaven. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Matthew chapter 3. Matthew chapter 4. He steps into the wilderness and the first word he hears, if you are the Son of God. What's the devil trying to cause him to do? Doubt his past experience. Oh, come on now. There are those who, there are those who have known the parting love of Christ. Amen. There are those who de really desire to be children of God. Amen. Yet they know their life is imperfect and faulty and they, are, they wonder whether their lives have ever been renewed by the Holy Spirit. Has, has the devil ever tried that one on you? And you look around and you think, man, this is working for everyone else. How come it's not working for me? Yes. Beloved, let me tell you something. The moment you hear those whispers in your ear, you know it's the devil. There are those who have known the parting love of Christ and who really desire to be children of God, yet they realize their character is imperfect and their life is faulty and they are ready to doubt whether their hearts have ever been renewed by the Holy Spirit. To such I would say, this is the voice of God to you tonight, to such I would say, do not draw back in despair. What is the very thing you're tempted to do when you have fallen into that thing you said you wouldn't do again? Draw back in despair. I cannot tell you how many times I have come with tear-stained cheek and broken heart to the Bible in my morning devotions 
And I open up the Bible. And I hope it's still there. And I'm nervous. Because I've claimed this promise before, but I, I'm not sure it's going to be there this time. Okay. So I open up to 1 John. Yes. And I go to chapter 1, and I look yes. down, yes. and I see verse 8, and I see verse 10, yes. and then I look to see if verse 9 is there. And you know what? It's always there. Yes. If David confesses his sin... He is faithful and just to forgive him his sins and to cleanse him of all unrighteousness. And beloved, I can tell you with trembling hand and tear-stained cheek, every time I have gotten up to claim that verse, every time I have risen to claim this verse, it's always been there. The only time this verse will not work for you is the one time you don't get up to claim it. Wow. Come on. To such I would say, do not draw back in despair. And here we go. We shall often. Yeah, yeah. We shall, what's that word? Uh-huh. We shall often uh-huh. have to bow down yeah. and weep at the feet of Jesus yeah. because of our shortcomings and mistakes. But we are not to be discouraged. Come on. Now, I have to tell you something. I heard an Adventist preacher, a well intentioned Adventist preacher, read this very passage because of our shortcomings and mistakes. And he said, She didn't say sins. She said shortcomings and mistakes. And I thought, well, that's interesting. So I thought that through. Follow these illustrations with me. Shortcomings and mistakes. What he was saying is, is you might make a mistake. You might have a shortcoming, but that's different from a sin. Wow. So imagine this with me. Imagine that you, we'll do one for the ladies and one for the men. Imagine that you, young lady, Invite my wife and my family over to your house for some food. Say, oh, come over. We're going we're gonna to eat together. You're going to cook some food. And so you, what are you going to cook me? Ladies, what are you, you going to cook me? What are you going to make me? Spaghetti. I'll take it. Oh, collard greens. I'll take it. Some mac and cheese. Oh, some pinto beans. Oh, some, some fried chick, of course. Cornbread, I'll take it. Anything but haystacks. Come on, preacher. Come on, preacher. Come on, preacher. I'm I'm haystacked out. Okay? So you have me over, and we're sitting there in your living room. We're in your living room, and you're a talker, and I'm a talker. So, oh, oh, you're from, and my sister, and she, and she went to the, and oh, no, you. And then we, we start to smell something burning. And you go in and you say, oh, I burned the pinto beans. And I burned everything else. Okay, now because we were talking, we were so busy talking. Ah! Now let me ask you a question. Ladies, did, did you mean to burn the pinto beans? No, you didn't. That was a mistake. Now, do you think you would then go into your bedroom and bow down and weep at the feet of Jesus because you burned the pinto beans? Yes or no? Yes or no? Okay, how about one for the men? Let's say that you get yourself a dog. A real, not a chihuahua, a dog. A real dog, like a dog that you have to build a house for, not one you can put in a shoebox. Okay? So you want to, you you know, you're feeling manly, you're feeling Home Depot. So (laughs) you go to to doghouse.com and you download the plans. And you got your tool belt. You had to borrow it from your neighbor, but you got it. You got your hammer, tape measure, and you're ready to. And so you're reading the instructions, you go down to Home Depot, you get your lumber, you're just feeling like there's just madness just exuding it. Oh, sweetie, what are you going to do today? I'm building a doghouse. <laughs> so you, you're measuring, you've got to measure. And so part of the plans call for, for cutting four boards, three foot, one and a quarter inch. Three foot, one and a quarter. So you can do that. You went to Oakwood. <laughs> Say three foot. 
one and a quarter, you mark it, and you cut it. Okay, got it. Second board, three foot one and a quarter. You mark that, you cut it. How many are we cutting? Cutting four. We got our third one. One and a quarter, we cut that one. And then your friend texts you. Oh, yeah, you text, texting. Start texting. Then you measure that fourth one quickly, and then you cut it. Then you go to put your doghouse together. And you get out there, and you, you, you start putting it together. And you notice it's not quite sitting right. You think, man, it's not sitting level. The roof is not, it's not, it's teetering. And you think, hmm, I know I measured all those boards and cut them. So you go back and you measure that first board, three foot one and a quarter. You measure that second one, three foot one and a quarter. You measure that third one, three foot one and a quarter. And you measure that fourth one, and wouldn't you know it? You left off the quarter part, three foot one. Would you call that a shortcoming? Would you call that a shortcoming? She says we shall often have to bow down and weep at the feet of Jesus because of our shortcomings and mistakes. And this preacher said, that's not sins. Beloved, let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. If you burn the pinto beans, you don't weep at the feet of Jesus. If you cut the board too short, you don't weep at the feet of Jesus. It's when you look at that website you said you weren't going to look at again that you weep at the feet of Jesus. It's when you talk in that way that you said you weren't going to talk anymore that you weep at the feet of Jesus. It's when you do that thing that you said you weren't going to do, when you have that thought that you said you weren't, that's when you weep at the feet of Jesus. Of course she's talking about sins. She says we shall often have to bow down and weep at the feet of Jesus, but we are not to be discouraged. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It doesn't hurt to read the rest of the context, by the way. She says, listen to this, even if we are overcome by the enemy, I suppose that would be a sin. Satan didn't overcome you and make you burn the pinto beans. Satan didn't make you cut the board too short. Satan's the one that got you on that stupid website. Satan's the one that made you act that way. Satan's the one that got you in bed with that person when you're in bed with the wrong person. Even if we are overcome by the enemy. Listen to these words. I want you to listen to these words tonight because these words are the words from Jesus to you. We are not cast off. Can you say amen? See, you thought you were cast off. And, and, and don't, don't, don't play games. You thought you were cast off. It's exactly how you felt. But you see, when you become a Bible-believing Christian, yes, there's a difference. Fact comes face to face with feeling. And how you feel may or may not be consistent with the facts. And the fact is, you are not cast off. Not forsaken and rejected of God. She says, no. Christ is at the right hand of God who also makes intercession for us. Said the beloved John, these things I write to you that you sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Beloved, I want to tell you something. The single secret to succeeding in the Christian walk is to keep getting up. Listen to what she's saying. We shall often have to bow down and weep at the feet of Jesus because of our shortcomings and mistakes. Are you struggling? You should praise God that you're struggling. Is there something in your life that is pulling you down and you feel like it's going to get control over you? If you feel that way, you should praise God because it shows that there's something in you that's still resisting it. Wow. What did Jesus say? He said it's not going to happen overnight. Some of you are discouraged with the Christian faith and you're 23. You're just getting started in this thing. No man having drunk the old wine immediately desires the new. He still thinks the old is better. This transition doesn't happen immediately. What did Paul say? Faith to faith. Glory to glory. Day by day. Paul agrees with Jesus and Jesus agrees with Paul and Ellen White agrees with both of them. There is no such thing as instantaneous sanctification. You thought there was. No, there's not. That struggle that's going on in your heart, that struggle that's going on in your life, that thing that you are wrestling with, you thought that was bad news. I have news for you. The struggle itself is a sign that the life of God is still working in you. 
And I plead with you on behalf of Jesus to hear this message. I plead with you on behalf of Jesus to hear this message. If you're a struggling Christian here tonight, listen to me. You're still a Christian. If you're a struggling Christian here tonight, you are still a Christian. Two questions as we close. Number one, has this presentation made sense? Are we together, everyone? It's a good one. Second question. There's not a doubt in my mind. There is not a doubt in my mind that there is someone here tonight who has been on the verge not of getting up, but of giving up. Let me let you in on a little secret. Every saint has a past. But every sinner has a future. See, some of you have fallen. And there's a temptation and the devil's whispering in your ear. It's not working. It's not working for you. Stay down. Just throw it in. It's working for others. It's not working for you. And there's the temptation and someone here has been tempted not to keep getting up, but to give up. I wonder if there's someone here tonight who has heard the voice of Jesus speaking to them saying, my son, my daughter, don't you give up. We're in this together. You get up. Don't make him any promises. He doesn't need your promises. He just needs you. There's a burden on my heart, especially for the young people. Don't give up. Get up. You keep on keeping on. The Bible itself tells you this is how it's supposed to be. Faith to faith, glory to glory, day by day. Is there someone here tonight who wants to stand for Jesus and say, I was on the verge of giving up. But tonight I have heard a word from the Lord. And by His grace, I want to get up. Is there someone tonight who's going to stand? God bless you, brother. God bless you, sister. God bless, if that applies, you stand to your feet. The devil's been whispering. Give up. Give up. It's working for everybody else. It ain't working for you. But tonight you have heard the word of the Lord. You haven't heard the word of David, heaven forbid. You've heard the word of the Lord. And the word of the Lord is faith to faith, day by day, glory to glory. No man having drunk old wine immediately desires anew. And tonight you've heard the word of the Lord. And you say, by his grace, I'm going to be that just man. Yeah, he fell. But he fell because he was up and I'm not making any promises just keep your promises to yourself all they are is ropes of sand anyway you just walk with Jesus you may fall incidentally part of walking is falling do you know that have you ever seen a dog fall doesn't happen a dog has four legs one, two, three, four. If a dog loses a leg, he still has three. Principle of triangulation, right? Three points make a plane. He's not going to fall. He's all right. If a deer loses a leg, he's fine. It's not going to fall. But the Bible says God made man upright. You're not a quadruped. You're a biped. You have two legs. You stand upright. You only have two points of contact with the terra firma. Everybody falls learning to walk. Everybody. See, because you only have two points of contact. And if you lose one, you're going down. Falling is part of walking. Have you fallen? It means you're walking. Keep getting up. Keep getting up. Can you say amen? Don't you dare stay down. Don't you dare stay down. 
The grace of Jesus is sufficient for you. You keep getting up. What does she say? We shall often have to bow down and weep at the feet of Jesus. You keep getting up. You keep getting up. You keep getting up. You keep getting up. Am I making myself clear? You keep getting up. And one of these days, you mark my word, you're going to walk away from that one for the last time. That one will be behind you. Are we together? Father in heaven, you see your people. Father, you see your people, some standing, some sitting, all in need of grace. Father, we confess that there is a struggle raging in our hearts. And Father, up until tonight, some of us have thought that was bad news. But tonight we have seen that the struggle itself is a sign of life. Father, some of us have been tempted to discouragement. Some of us have thought to throw in the towel. Some of us thought we should give up. But tonight we have heard the word of the Lord. Don't give up. Get up. Father, the prayer of my heart for every young person here. I don't know them. I don't know what they're struggling with, but I can only imagine. I know what goes on in my heart. I want to pray for that sister who's tempted to discouragement. May she hear the word of the Lord tonight. Keep getting up. I want to pray for that brother who's in the theology program, who feels as though he's wondering, he's questioning his calling. He's wondering, I don't feel like a saint. Sometimes I don't live like a saint. Father, help that brother to hear tonight. You keep getting up. I want to pray for every student who's here, every program, whatever it is that they're studying, whatever it is that they're wrestling with. Help them to hear the word of Scripture. A just man falls seven times and rises up again. In Jesus' name, let all of those who are going to keep getting up say, Amen. Amen. Turn to the brother or the sister next to you. Give them a word of encouragement. This media was provided by Hope Media Ministry. For this and other great witnessing material, please visit our website at www.hopevideo.com Dot com. Our email address is hope at hopevideo.com. You can also listen to much of our media at our online media center for free at www.hopevideo.com. That's hopevideo.com.